This is Stanford Engineering's The Future of Everything, and I'm your host, Russ Altman. If you enjoy The Future of Everything podcast, please follow or subscribe on whatever app you listen to it with. You'll hear about new episodes, and you'll also help us grow. Today, Professor Polly Fordyce from Stanford University will tell us about how her lab studies the structure and function of proteins. You know, DNA gets a lot of press. DNA, the genome, it's in my DNA, 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 DNA. But proteins actually do a lot of the work in cells. And in fact, they're the ones who read off whatever the DNA is telling us and turn it into action. It's the future of proteins. Before we jump into the podcast, I'd like to give you a reminder to rate and review the podcast and also tell your friends about it. It'll help us get better and it'll help us grow. Many of us have heard about DNA. DNA stores the instructions for how cells should be built and how they should function. But proteins are another important biological molecule. And in fact, much of the job of the DNA is simply to encode where, when, and how to make the proteins that do a lot of the work. Proteins catalyze chemical reactions. They interact with DNA to figure out what needs to happen and when. And they serve structural functions of support so that cells are not just floppy bags, but have the right structure and rigidity that they need for the processes of life. Polly Fordyce is a professor of bioengineering and genetics at Stanford University, and her lab studies proteins with high throughput measurements. Rarely will Polly's group measure one thing. They measure 1,500 things at a time, and that leads to a quantitative and qualitative change in their understanding of protein structure and function. She'll start out by telling us about one of her favorite proteins. Polly, your group works on protein structure and function, and when most people think about proteins, what they know is they need to eat the right amount of protein in their diet, and that there's a lot of protein in their muscles. You make a study of this for your life. I think the best way to start out is, what is a protein and why do you find them so fascinating? Uh, it's a good question, Russ. So I would say uh, it's hard to pick a favorite protein, but what got me into this whole business in the first place was when I was a brand new PhD student um, here at Stanford actually, I got here and Steve Block gave a talk about his research. And what he was doing was he was studying, you have some cells in your body that extend all the way from the base of your spine to the tip of your toes. And they have a nucleus at one end, but they need to get all of the stuff that they make in the nucleus to the rest of the cell. And if they just relied on diffusion to do it, it would take decades. And so your cell has this entire transport system of these motor proteins that actually, you know, move, they move parts of themselves kind of like walking on a road. They walk on these filaments in your cell to tow cargo everywhere. And so, you know, 20 years ago, <laughs> that idea that there were these proteins that actually could tow cargo, they turned chemical energy into motion. They were the most efficient motors we've ever seen, far more efficient than anything we've ever built. Um, that idea that there were molecular machines at the nanoscale was just incredibly cool to me. So that was the first protein I fell in love with. I actually have a little sculpture of it in my office. Uh, but you know, that is now awesome. if I had to, yeah. <laughs> uh, but now if I had to pick, you know, there are a whole host that we're working on in our lab, but that was sort of my first love, I'd say. Great. So, okay. So sh we should think of these as they're obviously they're molecules. They're made out of atoms, uh, uh, I, hundreds or thousands of atoms, I presume. So when you're yes. talking about walking, this is really happening at the atomic level. These are atoms moving past other atoms. So these, this first, this first protein I studied, it's called kinesin. Uh, it actually takes eight nanometer steps, right? So, uh, you know, a nanometer is a millionth of a millimeter, Whoa. right? And it would take eight steps at a time as it was walking along these subunits in the road that it was walking on. And we built, you know, the, the other thing that was really fascinating to me at the time was we built a lot of really complicated machines with microscopes and lasers that allowed us to actually visualize single proteins as they walked, as they took chemical energy uh, from molecules and turned it into this motion and walked in the cell. Uh, and so, you know, those two ideas, I guess, the idea that, that proteins are these molecular machines that do work in your cell. They do a whole host of really incredible things in your cell. And then the idea that we could actually watch them in some way as they were doing their tasks, if we could just build the right instruments, all of that to me was really 
fascinating. Great, great. Okay, so when somebody Google's your name, what we, uh, which I recently did in the last twenty four hours, uh, what we are struck by is it's all about protein structure and protein function. So, so tell me about protein structure and function, and if it's like many other things in the world, those two things are intimately related. They are. <laughs> so, um, you know, what I think is incredibly exciting right now is that proteins are made of these linear chains of amino acids and they have to, they about half of them actually have to fold into a three dimensional conformation in order to do their job. So they assume a shape and we always talk about that as their structure. Um, and then once they're in that structure, they do some kind of function. So maybe they bind your DNA, maybe they bind other proteins, maybe they receive signals from the environment to tell your cells what to do. They coordinate everything that's happening in the cells. Um, and so I think in the last year, well, maybe five years, I would say, there's been a really incredible progress in the ability to take all of these models, like models that we train on human language, and get them to read the sequences of the linear, the linear building blocks that make up a letter and predict the structure that it's going to have. Yes. And yes. So this is like, like, we've heard about alpha fold, for example, is that that's what you mean, I think. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. So AlphaFold has really taken my uh, little world by storm, I would say, where, you know, it's really solved kind of a 50 year grand challenge in biology. But I think that what we really want to do next is we want to get to the next step where we could actually make machines that would do things that we wanted. So maybe you know, we could use them to catalyze green chemistry and we would get rid of waste. We could use them to clean up plastics. We could use them as new drugs or therapies. But in order to get there, we have to get for, to the next level of the problem, which is going from how sequence encodes the shape to how it encodes the actual function. And that's what my lab is sort of all about, is trying to figure that out. Yeah, so, so, let, let, so great. So I think we have, a, we have now a good idea of these proteins. They have the, they're small, but they're made out of thousands of atoms and maybe millions, uh, but they are still very small. They fold into some shape. There's been progress on that. And then Polly Fordyce's lab now gets in, in very interested in, the fun in understanding the function. And, and so I know that, that there's a lot of technology development here, and it's very exciting because um, I think traditionally people did experiments in test tubes and they measured one thing. And I, and I know that your lab has changed that paradigm. So can you take us through... What were the ideas that you had and then what did they turn into in terms of accelerating our understanding of function? So I would say I'm really lucky to have landed at Stanford where, um, you know, my lab has developed a lot of technologies where the goal of our technologies, much like integrated circuits, kind of took computers and shrunk them down so we could do electronic calculations in a really small full footprint. My lab really specializes in trying to make these fluidic technologies that shrink down the volumes that we need to do. So now instead of doing you know, one experiment at a time using a big test tube, we can do a thousand experiments at a time using tiny little one nanoliter chambers. Um, and so that's my specialty, but I was lucky to come here to Stanford where there are people like Dan Hirschlag, who's been spending his career decades trying to understand how enzymes um, you know, they, which they can take a chemical reaction that would take longer than the lifetime of the universe, and they can speed it up so that it happens the second it hits that protein, right? They're really these incredible catalysts. And people like Dan were using all of the traditional techniques to try and understand how that works. So they had all of these questions about how does this linear sequence of amino acids encode this incredible chemical function, but they, it was really hard. It would take years to be able to make and characterize you know, uh, a reasonable set of mutants. And so with Dan, we were able to team up. Uh, I was able to learn some of the enzymology from him. And then we were able to make a tool where now we can make a thousand, really 1500 different enzyme variants. <clears throat> so we can cho change one thing at a time, or um, we can change a bunch of things at a time in that sequence. We can make that molecular machine. And then we can ask how that molecular machine character how it catalyzes different chemistries or how it functions under different conditions to really get a broad picture of what it does. Right. Okay. So when you say, you, you said the word mutant and, 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 and you said <laughs> that this is when you change one of those amino acids in that long string. Um, <clears throat> so that means that each one of those um, 
uh, proteins that you create and put into these 1500 little little tiny teensy tiny beakers every one of those is slightly different and therefore they may i'm presuming they may have a slightly different structure and a slightly or very different function and so just to make it very real what are the en actual enzymes that you look at and what are the things that they do so we started with i think this often happens in science and technology development we started with a protein that um, I love now. It's an alkaline phosphatase superfamily member called PAFE. I have now studied it for six or seven years. There was nothing particularly interesting about this protein when we started, <laughs> except for that it was going to be really easy to study in the platform. It was super efficient, right? Yes. It takes a reaction that takes longer than the lifetime of the universe, and it catalyzes it the okay, second but that a molecule tell me the Okay, tell me the reaction. Even if you think it's boring, I want to hear uh, it. It takes a, um, a phosphate monoester, okay. and it cleaves the phosphate off. So it cuts off is, a phosphate. It cuts off a phosphate. That's okay, what it does. Okay, fair enough. And you have found that over the last seven years to be a fascinating question. Yes. <laughs> yes. Please go yes. on. Please go on. So I found it to be a really fascinating question because, you know, these enzymes at their – where they do the chemistry is called the active site. So they have kind of like a special part, and that's where they make conditions really favorable for this particular chemical reaction to happen. And so that's kind of the business end of the protein, and we know that's really important. But one of the questions that we had was, you know, th this, this protein is made up of 526 different linear bl building blocks, 526 amino acids. How many of them make a difference? You know, if you, if you change them, how, you know, is it that only the active site matters? Or do right. most of them matter? Right. And we didn't know that because we couldn't do that experiment before. Uh, and so what I thought was really fascinating was about two thirds of them. If you make a change, they affect its function. Huh. Right. So this big enzyme where we've been really focused on the active site, it turns out that in order to get where we want to go to actually design a functional molecule, we're not going to be able to just take that active site and stick it in another protein and call it good. And so nature it, kind of uh, uh, made the protein exactly how it needed to, and it didn't have a lot of fluff. Exactly. Yeah, it didn't have a lot of fluff. And there's even, you know, as is actually, I've joked about this with Dan a lot. At the very beginning, if you told me that I was going to care about some of these things, there's like these chemicals called transition state analogs that chemists use to look at very specific properties of the enzyme while it's doing the chemical reaction. There are two different ones, vanadate and tungstate, that differ by less than a tenth of an angstrom. If you had told me four years ago that I was going to care about this, I would, <laughs> I would not have cared <laughs> about it at all. But it turns out to be really cool in that if you make some, if you make some of these mutations really far away from the active site, you know, all the way on the surface, uh, those mutations change whether it binds one or the other of these transition state analogs, even though they're almost identical, okay. right? So it, you know, when you're talking about that, there's not a lot of fluff, right? It really kind of blew my mind how little fluff there was. Do the, so those functional, so the, these, these mutations that you make, they definitely have sounds like functional consequences. Are they also changing the, the three dimensional structure of what the protein looks like? Yes. So, and there's a few different ways that, uh, that this can happen. So that's one of the things that we're developing in our lab is, trying to figure out exactly how much a mutation changes the conformation versus uh, the activity, we call it, conformation or activity. Um, but in this case, what was kind of interesting, this protein that we started with, was, which was kind of an unusual protein, it's secreted. And so bacterial cells secrete it into the environment. Um, and so they want it to be really, really stable. Uh -huh. We chose it because we thought a single mutation would be unlikely to... Um, to, to unfold it, but it turns out that because it's so stable, it's really easy for it to get stuck in the wrong conformation. So if you make a mutation, often some of it will still fold up nicely, but it folds up into the wrong shape. So, okay, so the six or seven years on a protein that you've grown to love, are we done with that protein? Is it like a totally understood system? And if not, what are the questions that like still are driving you and your collaborator, Dan? Yeah, so I would say um, one kind of, really interesting thing that we found was not only do mutations have effects even really far away from the active site, but there are kind of big sort of in 3D space, there's big clusters 
of these residues that all have a really similar impact. And so, you know, the next question is, was, is this, was, were we lucky and PAFE was special in some way? And it's the only protein that has things like that? Or are right. all really right. stable proteins have it? Is it really big ones that have it and really small ones that don't? If you look at ones that are like PAFE siblings, it's cousins. Do they all have the same sort of, we call it a functional architecture? Right, right. So you've learned all these lessons and you can't tell yet if these are general principles applicable to all proteins or if you're going to have to do this in your little tiny nanoliter wells for a, mil a bunch of more proteins before you know for sure that these are the principles. Exactly. And I think one reason why we care beyond it just being cool is, you know, when we think about a lot of the proteins in our cells that are really important for, you know, when we think about cancer or other diseases, a lot of them involve these phosphatase proteins, these proteins that do the same type of chemistry. But in our bodies, it's been really hard uh, because their active site, their business end looks the same. Uh, if you have one that's doing the wrong thing, it's really hard to specifically target that one with a drug without messing all the other ones up. And so I'm particularly excited about the idea that is this a way where we might be able to figure out a far away surface on these proteins that we could target therapeutically? Uh, you know, could we scan using our new tools to try and find those faraway surfaces that then drug companies could use to try and develop new therapies. And, and, and I presume that those services, those surfaces might be specific to the one you're trying to get at and not its siblings that look similar. And therefore you have a much more specific drug, for example. That's the, that's the idea. Great. Yeah. This is the future of everything with Russ Altman. More with Polly Fordyce next. Welcome back to the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Professor Polly Fordyce from Stanford. In the last segment, Polly told us about how she makes measurements of proteins, uh, multiple measurements all at once in little tiny beakers. Uh, and this allows her group to understand details about how proteins function. In this segment, she will tell us how proteins actually read DNA and decide what other proteins should be made. This is often in response to SOS signals from the cell saying that something needs to change. Polly, I know you also work on DNA and in fact, how DNA interacts with protein. So give us a little primer on how we should think about DNA at these scales that you, that you think about. And then why are proteins important even when we think about DNA? One thing that I think is really fascinating is that all of the cells in your body have exactly the same genome. Uh, but somehow your eye knows that it's supposed to be an eye. Your liver knows that it's supposed to be a liver. And the way they do it is with the same genome, it's sort of like they have a recipe book for different proteins. Uh, and, the, and, the, and that's your genome is the recipe book. And then they're sort of deciding which recipes they're going to make in any kind of cell. Uh, and that is something that's controlled by proteins. Uh. So there are proteins whose job it is to find specific parts in the genome that are right next to a recipe that you want to make. And then they bring a bunch of the rest of the protein machinery to come. And, you know, like Central of Dogma of Biology says DNA makes RNA makes protein. They turn on expression of those proteins in order to kind of dictate what the cell should be doing. And so right, it's a puzzle. Right. Yeah. How so like the liver cell to is going to turn on all the liver recipes, but there are proteins making those decisions about which part of the genome to read. Exactly. Okay. So, so it's a, you know, for me, it's another, another question I think is really fascinating is you're a protein, you have this 25 megabase genome, and somehow you have to figure out where you're supposed to go in order to bind the DNA and call the rest of your protein friends in order to start uh, transcription and, and making other proteins so that the cell is doing what it's supposed to do. That, that really rings true because at home I do I do some baking and all my recipes are just in a big pile with no organization whatsoever. So I have to figure out that exact same problem every Sunday morning when I figure out where the heck is my recipe for whatever. Sorry, please exactly. continue. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I guess, you know, you think, it, uh, how does a protein know? How do we encode the instructions for when should you turn genes on and off? Like, we, you know, it's been a long time since we decoded the part of the genome that codes for proteins. You know, we know the triplet code that says how DNA, you know, encodes for a particular protein, but we don't understand the code yet for when it should be turning that particular recipe on and off. Okay. So what are you going to do? 
So we're going to do kind of what we always do, <laughs> which is um, we're going to make a whole bunch of nanoliter chambers, and then we're going to systematically vary either the um, sequence of the DNA or we're going to vary the sequence of the protein, and we're going to try and make you know thousands or millions of physical measurements of the relative energies of binding and the kinetics of binding. So the energy of binding is how tightly they bind, and the kinetics is how long it takes for them to find each other? To come on or come off. And come on or come off. One thing that we haven't talked about <laughs> is um, I do think it's really important, an advantage of making the measurements using that those sort of terms like energies or rates, or it doesn't matter whether I make that measurement in my laboratory or you make it in yours or somebody else makes it in theirs, you know, around the world. It means if we have those numbers that are on an absolute physical scale, now we can combine the insights from all of our different labs. And then, you know, that becomes a data set that now our computational colleagues can use to make the same sort of strides that we previously made in predicting structure. Yes, yes. Uh, and, and so what you're implying is there is a currency for uh, and the units of which about which these are measured is not up for discussion. The scientific community has agreed. And therefore, um, if I can get way better data uh, uniformity because of this mm -hmm. agreement that you've all mm -hmm. made. OK, so. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, so, OK, so you put in, uh, in in all these wells. Oh, it sounds to me like you're going to have to introduce me to another protein that is doing this binding to the DNA. Yes. So tell me yeah, about okay. the protein. Uh, so we have two, I guess, uh, they're transcription factor proteins is what they're called. Um, we have two of them that we've studied a lot, um, some favorites. One is called Bofor, and it is a protein in yeast whose job is to sense when the yeast don't have enough phosphate. Actually, it's phosphate again. Uh, it's important currency in biology. And then when they see that the cell doesn't have enough phosphate, they go to the nucleus, they find the instructions that say, turn on these genes that are going to like scavenge more phosphate, get us okay. more phosphate. Okay. That's what they do. Perfect yeah. sense. That makes perfect sense. And, 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 and yeah. their task is now clear. Find those proteins that kind of increase my phosphate. Um, mm -hmm. And then tell me about the DNA side. Is it a special piece of DNA in any way or... Yeah. It is. We even we have a we have a special name for it. It's called an e box, which just means that it's C A C G T G. And oh, those are actually have, those are actually DNA bases. DNA bases. So say yes. that slowly, and, because w many of us don't speak <laughs> DNA quite as much as you do. Uh, C A C G T G. Okay. Is kind of each of these transcription factors we it has its own favorite. We call it their consensus site. It's their own favorite site that they're looking for in the genome. And when you talk to people like Anshul Kandaji, who studies these, you know, tries to figure out what these uh, consensus sequences are for lots of transcription factors, they can really read DNA. They see a sequence. They can tell you exactly who they think is likely wow. to be there, right. which is so cool. But what I think what's most interesting to me is it's not simple, like on your computer where you can control F and look for a CAC GTG and say, this protein's going to go here. Instead, there's a lot of places where their favorite sequence is and you don't find them in a cell. And there's a lot of places where they appear to be bound, but they don't have their favorite sequence. Okay. And so that is a big focus of my lab is, you know, how do they know where they're supposed to go in a cell? And a lot of the work that we've been doing is it turns out that the DNA letters that are around a favorite sequence, those ones can have a really big impact on whether or not a transcription factor goes there. So it, it likes CAC, GTG, but it also likes the environment around that uh, in, in order to kind of set the mood and make it uh, be very happy binding that particular. Um, so so do these proteins, they, they, they actually in some way can read the DNA. They can tell the difference, obviously, between an A, C, T, and G, but based on the different atomic properties of, the, of, those, mm -hmm. of those letters of the DNA. Yeah, so, there, so you know, DNA, uh, it actually has, you don't see this a lot, uh, but when if you look at a sculpture of DNA, which yes, they have in a of lot course. of places. Right? Uh, the famous double right, helix, the famous double helix. The famous double helix. If they did it right, the double helix is right-handed, not left-handed. Sometimes they mess it up. And then uh, it actually has two grooves, a minor groove and a major groove. 
Uh, and those two grooves are different widths and different transcription factors interact with different grooves in order to figure out where they're supposed to go. Uh, so the ones, the ones like these ones that I'm talking about, they're major groove readers and they stick part of their protein kind of into that big wide groove in the DNA. And they actually read out the nucleotide bases with physical bonds. Um, other ones, you know, tend to sort of hover around they take positively charged residues and stick them in the minor groove and that gives them information about where they are. All right. Oh, that's very yeah. cool. Okay. So you really painted a great picture that it's a very intimate interaction between the protein and the DNA. Like, basically could hardly get closer physically. Um, <laughs> if it's a match, if, if the protein says I found my favorite and the environment and I, I like what I'm seeing everywhere else as well. Um, what happens in the cell? Like what, what, what is this trigger <laughs> Uh, that would get us excited. Yeah, so this is, you know, this is really funny in that we've spent, as scientists, it was, this was kind of an easier problem to figure out uh, which DNA a particular transcription factor likes to bind. And they usually have kind of a folded part and then they have a whole part that's not folded at all. It's just kind of like spaghetti in space. So for decades, we've kind of cut off the spaghetti in space because it's hard to work with. And we've just asked, how do you find the DNA? But you're right that their job isn't done. <laughs> then they got to turn on transcription. Right. And so somehow that spaghetti part. It's funny because this. I just I'm sorry to interrupt, but we had this exact discussion about your your favorite protein when you were saying it wasn't clear if the business end was the only thing that mattered or if the whole rest of it mattered, too. And you learned there that the whole rest did matter. And I'm getting a strong feeling you're about to tell me that the whole rest also matters in this case. I know. You know, it's like it's funny to have decades of your own work reduced to, you know, one sentence, like turns out the whole thing matters. But <laughs> yeah, it, I mean, it does. The whole so thing please, matters, please tell so. me. I'm sorry I interrupted, but I, I, it was just a striking parallel. Uh, yeah. So, you know, we're kind of we're lucky in that I'm in the bioengineering department with Locker Bintu, and she does these really cool things in cells where she basically tries to ask you know, their job is to turn transcription on. She has these cell-based assays where she makes millions of different parts of the spaghetti and asks which one turns something on. And now in my lab, we're trying to ask, we, we know that when they're bound there, they're supposed to recruit particular co-activators. Then those co-activators recruit another protein, uh, RNA polymerase, an enzyme, whose job is to actually copy the DNA and make yeah. RNA. Great. Um, and, and so we're trying to do a bunch of experiments now to figure out of those spaghettis that talk to these other spaghettis, who talks to who, how strongly do they talk to each other, uh, how fast do they come on and off, and then can we use that information to predict not just where a transcription factor binds in a cell, but what it's going to do. Can we decode the instructions for the yes. when to make a recipe? Yeah, no, I, I, your description is really amazing because just to review, we had a bunch of atoms interacting to, to decide that they liked each other. But then in a few sentences, you got us to the decision by the cell to make an entirely new and different protein. And I think that gives people a really nice uh, kind of understanding of how these atomic level events that seem inconsequential actually lead to all the processes of life. Well, listen, in the last minute, I want to just ask you, uh, what is what does the future hold? What 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 are your priorities for the future? And um, kind of making sure that not only your progress continues, but that the world's progress in understanding these phenomena continues. So I think these measurements are super important, uh, and a lot of people want to make them. They're technically hard. Uh, you know, my lab has people from computer science, mechanical engineering, you know, all the chemistry, all different kinds of of people come together to be able to do these really hard problems. Um, and so I would like to first build a bunch of instruments here where other people could come and do experiments um, under some uh, the guidance of a professional so that more of these measurements could get made. And then long term, we're spending a lot of time thinking about how we can make them easier for other labs to make. Right. Um, and so I, one way that we go do ahead. this. I want to hear about that. That sounds good. <laughs> We have, um, we can make these tiny beads. So these beads are um, little hydrogels, kind of, you know, almost like that. There was that drink in the 90s called Orbits. <laughs> and these like floating particles. It's sort of like that. Is it like boba tea? I think that's a more, yes. a more it's present. Like a, yes. <laughs> yeah, thanks for keeping me current, Russ. Yeah. 
uh, like tiny boba tea, much smaller than the right. bobas, but, uh, and we can make them up to a thousand different colors by putting these crazy materials called lanthanide nanophosphors in them. So now we can attach a thousand different things where the color of the tiny boba just encodes what was attached. And now we can probe binding between, you know, a thousand proteins and one other protein, or, you know, we can start to scale that up more and more. And you can send these boba teas all around the world. Yes, we can send these boba. These boba teas are more portable for other people right. to use. Great. Yeah. Well, thanks to Polly Fordyce. That was the future of proteins. You've been listening to The Future of Everything with Russ Altman. If you enjoy the podcast, please consider subscribing or following. It'll help us and it'll keep you abreast of all the new releases. Maybe tell your friends about it too and definitely rate and review it so we can get better. We also have more than 200 interviews in our back catalog. There's a lot of good stuff there and I recommend you check it out. You can connect with me on Twitter at RB Altman or with Stanford Engineering at Stanford ENG.